David, thank you so much for electing to come to this session um, where we'll be talking about mobile technologies to support field research. Um, I want to give you a little bit of context in terms of who I am and my context at work. Um, I'm from the University of Guelph, uh, about an hour outside of Toronto in Canada. And in uh, 2009, our library undertook a major organizational renewal process where we looked at um, new directions for the library. And one of the things that we recognized at that time is where the library traditionally is very focused on teaching and learning, that there was a need for us to engage more fully with the research aspect of uh, the campus. So we established this new team, which was Research Enterprise and Scholarly Communication. And so um, I've been the head of that team since its uh, inception. So some of the things that we do, um, we're very focused on research data management. We um, have a data repository, data repository where we've been recruiting um, data sets from researchers for purposes of preserva preservation as well as publication, sharing of, of research data. Um, we also focus on um, the publication component of the research life cycle. So we, um, um, we host about 20 open access scholarly peer-reviewed journals. We have uh, the institutional repository for um, for the uh, faculty who want to uh, archive their publications in an open access repository. We also um, have a consultation service for author rights, um, advising um, authors on campus about strategically the best options available to them in terms of publishing, um, negotiating um, publishing agreements with publishers, that sort of thing. So that's sort of the context. Another important piece of the puzzle that I wanted to draw attention to is we recognized very early on that there were some key partnerships that we had to form. So we've created um, a sort of tripartite committee, which is the library, the camp central campus com computing, and the office of research to so coordinate um, services for researchers on campus. So that's a, a very critical piece of the puzzle. Maybe I'll just check in at this point to make sure that um, my voice is carrying um, well enough for everybody to hear. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So we um, offer lots of support to researchers when they're working on campus, um, but once, you know, almost all disciplines have some element of field research and once researchers go out on field researchers, we quite literally leave them to their own devices. So I wanted to have a look at how we could provide support to researchers when they're conducting field research, specifically around the use of mobile technologies and even more specifically around data collection in particular when researchers are out in the field. And when I refer to field research, that means both um, Sort of localized field research. We actually at the University of Guelph, one of the main areas of research for us is agricultural research. So um, researchers quite literally are out in the field, even if they're not that far removed from the campus, they're out doing research in the field, but extending all the way to researchers who visit developing countries and do research there, both um, quantitative and qualitative data that they're generating through those research projects. So I'll talk a little bit about early on doing a little bit of um, literature review and make particular reference to um, a paper from the World Bank titled Co Cutting Costs, Boosting Quality and Collecting Data Real Time. Um, typically mobile technologies, mobile phones have been used extensively in the developing world for disseminating information, but not as much attention has been um, focused on their potential for collecting data. And so this uh, report from 2011, the World Bank, uh, was uh, very informative. While research to evaluate these mobile interventions has been growing, there are relatively few studies of the use of mobile technology itself as a researched research instrument in developing countries. The potential mobile phones hold in this regard is striking. Compared to a traditional process using paper and pencil forms 
with later transcription to a computer system, mobile devices offer immediate digitization and transmission of collected data at the point of survey, followed by automated data aggregation. As such, mobile phones promise faster, more cost-effective, and more accurate surveys. Most notably, the cost savings resulting from immediate digitization and transmission of collected data with sub subsequent automated data aggregation offset by far the purchasing and data transmission costs of mobile phones. So after the um, literature review that I conducted, what I've really been focused on is interviews with researchers as well as shadowing um, researchers when they're out in the field to learn firsthand what are some of the challenges that they face and some of the ways that we could offer support to those challenges. So during the interview, these are sort of the areas that I cover in the in in interview. What is their particular field environment that they're working in? What are their current data collection practices? How do they store data when they're away from the campus environment? What use do they currently make of mobile devices? And then what do they do with their data once they return to campus? So th those are some of the things that we cover. And I'll just go through some of the um, researchers that I've been working with to, to date to give you an example of, of what we've been doing. This one uh, represents a researcher in political science who um, has been traveling around Latin America um, interviewing and conducting surveys with um, indigenous NGO groups. Um, essentially what he's looking at is how disadvantaged and mar marginalized groups can use information to improve their position and fight for expanded political and social rights. So he um, chose to distribute paper surveys because he didn't want to limit his um, subject group by only those who had access to the internet. So he was collecting um, incredible volumes of paper surveys that he was then transporting um, across borders within Latin America. Um, so this became one of his challenges. He also was conducting interviews where he was transcribing the interviews, well, conducting the interviews during the day and then transcribing those interviews in the evening. And once he had transcribed the interviews, he was um, deleting um, the original audio recordings. And this was part of his agreement for uh, research ethics, that these would be deleted. Um, Another researcher here is an agricultural horticulturalist who works with um, tomato breeding to try to uh, bring out through um, breeding programs particular qualities of the tomatoes. One of the things that was noteworthy about him is the amount of paraphernalia that he was taking out into the field with him. And so he deliberately posed um, showing you this carpenter's belt that he wears just to um, take care of all the, the um, paraphernalia he was working with. So he's got printouts of spreadsheets where he makes recordings. He's got pencils, notebooks, audio recorder, a camera, plus he has a knife for cutting open tomatoes, wire flags for marking particular plants. Um, not all of this, but um, um, quite a bit of it could be reduced with the simple use of a um, mobile device. Um, another researcher who uh, I've been working with is in environmental sciences. He works with um, beetles and how they choose their habitats. He also works in Vietnam with um, honeybees. He is a self-described technophobe, um, so he does all his recording on paper and then later transcription into spreadsheets. And he, his version of backup is to photocopy the original paper forms that he's been filling out. And interestingly, he does use a GPS device for recording GPS coordinates, but then he records them um, by hand on his uh, spreadsheets. And finally, another researcher who works in capacity development in Bangladesh, where he conducts surveys Basically what he's looking at is um, transfer of knowledge between farming communities in Bangladesh and how video can be used um, as a training tool 
and he's contrasting professionally produced videos with peer produced videos and the efficacy of the two types of, um, of videos. So again, he does a lot of, he has a very highly paper-based system where he's um, conducting focus groups, surveys, interviews, and uh, a huge investment in terms of transcription of all those um, research outputs um, after the fact. Um, another thing I wanted to draw your attention to is a, an undergraduate class that I've um, become involved with. The class is called Discovering Biodiversity and what they do is quite a large class. They have um, I think about 1500 students and essentially they're teaching them about field research. Um, so they're sending them, they break them down into groups of four students each and we have a um, a forest adjacent to the campus where they, they're sent into that forest, given a plot of land, and they have to identify all the plants within that plot of land, plot of land. and then all that data is then amalgamated so that the class as a whole can do analysis on the, the data that they themselves have collected. Um, so it's essentially a species census training students to do field research. And a quote from one of the faculty involved, it's great to have them working as biologists in the field because there, there's a perception that science is done in the lab with lab coats on. Fewer students have had the experience of immersing themselves in an ecosystem. We focused on skills training to identify plants and methods to analyze species diversity. So what they had been doing, again, all the observations were being recorded by um, pencil and paper, and then the GAs had the assignment of transcribing all this data um, into spreadsheets for um, amalgamation and later analysis. So I'm working with this class to introduce mobile technologies which will not only make it more efficient but also introduce things like authority controls so that the data will be cleaner when, it's, when it is captured. So I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the current practices and um, observations. Um, so Again, the, the typical scenario is that a researcher captures stuff on paper, transcribes it into the computer, which means double entry. It also means errors are introduced during the transcription process, um, and also the vulnerability of having the original data in paper form. Um, so by using mobile technologies, um, we cut down on the investment of time in collecting data, um, cut down on the errors, we also have added capabilities, so things like capturing GPS coordinates, um, adding audio or video recording. Um, some of the concerns that were expressed by researchers included um, using mobile techno technologies when you're in um, environments where there are adverse conditions, where your mobile technology could be um, damaged, but at the same time they wanted um, technology that was going to be lightweight. So one of the things that um, I've been looking at is um, some of these physical concerns of, of having a mobile um, device out in the field. So it, one researcher in particular, the uh, horticulturist, talked about the device needs to function well even in damp, hot or dusty conditions, but again needs to be lightweight. There are many, many um, products available to um, protect mobile technologies. This is one example called Griffin Survivor, which sells for about $50 and claims to have military ratings to survive shock, drop, wind and rain, vibration, sand and dust. Um, another area of concern is around uh, theft and loss and hacking. Uh, with mobile technologies. Just curious, has anyone had a personal disaster or crisis in terms of losing a, a, a mobile device? Um, any stories that you'd want to share about what that involved? Um, yeah? Wow, okay, so that, that compelling example for sure. Um, so there are things that we need to try to inform researchers about when they're traveling with these mobile devices. Um, the uh, political science researcher that I mentioned traveling in Latin America, he had concerns, especially um, when he was in Venezuela, in terms of being in very high um, crime areas. 
he actually opted to travel with a temporary, um, very low functioning cell phone rather than taking his BlackBerry just because he thought he would be um, less a target of crime with that device. Um, but some of the things that we can um, help them with are apps that allow, um, permit you to locate your device if you do lose it or if it's stolen to immediately wipe out any data that um, may reside on the de device. Um, you also have to be concerned about hacking um, where there can be malicious deleting or stealing of data. Um, things like avoiding public Wi-Fi networks or Bluetooth. Um, even um, turning off autocomplete on a um, mobile device can help to protect some of your credentials that you may have used. Um, and then a brief quote from a recent USA Today article. Another recent study analyzed two million currently available Android apps from both third parties and the Google Play Store, classifying 293,000 as outright malicious and an, and an additional 150,000 as high risk. When you factor in iOS, Windows Mobile, BlackBerry, and any other mobile platforms, the IT landscape is no longer centered on securing an exclusively Windows-based ecosystem. Um, so in terms of protecting data on the device itself, encryption is key. Um, whether it's on your device or whether you're storing things in the cloud, you need to uh, have a strategy for encryption. There are products available such as one called Box Cryptor, which offers encryption for virtually all major cloud storage providers um, for iOS and Android. Um, so then I want to turn my attention to data collection and there are various um, opportunities, sorry, various opportunities for collecting data using mobile um, devices. Um, one of them is through um, apps that are um, designed for a particular research project and this doesn't necessarily have to involve a developer. There are utilities available that make it very easy for the end user to custom de design apps and de deploy those apps um, for particular research projects. Um, this is something called Open Data Kit, which is an open source suite of tools from the University of Washington, which is the core of an ecosystem of open, open source tools. They receive financial support from Google. Um, it's an out-of-the-box solution for users to design data collection instruments, collect the data on mobile devices, and send to a server. Um, it can collect text, GPS location, photos, video, audio, and barcodes. One of the nice features about um, tools like this is that even when you're in an uh, environment where you don't have connectivity, it'll store the data on the device itself until you um, connect it to the internet and then automatically um, upload the data to the, the server. Um, so you can aggregate the collected data on a server and extract it in useful formats. It's, uh, this particular um, tool is used by the Jane Goodall Institute for Forest Monitoring. Um, are people familiar with Kiva, which is a, a sort of a micro-loan um, enterprise? It's used by Kiva for gathering borrower information. It's used by the Carter Center for Monitoring Elections, the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, John Hopkins Global Water Program, and the UC Berkeley Blum Center for Developing Economies. Um, in terms of designing a um, data collection instrument, there's a very simple drag and drop interface, but that has limited functionality. If you want to have more functionality, things like authority controls on the data elements or business logic built into the application, They've developed um, a form, a, an approach that's based on Excel spreadsheets, and I'll show you what that looks like. So you start off by defining your data model just by filling in um, a simple Excel spreadsheet. Um, you supplement that with any um, controls that you want on those data elements. So, for, for example, this is an example of an authority for um, browsers that would appear as a drop down on the interface. You deploy that um, form, upload it to the website where it is automatically available for registering um, 
subscription on a, a mobile device. You fill in your form, automatically update it to the server where it's immediately available for visualization, mapping, analysis, download, whatever you want to do. So it's an incredibly quick and easy um, approach to uh, to de developing a, a, um, a research instrument. Um, the, quoting the same um, World Bank 2011 report that I quoted before, they documented a 71% decrease in data collection costs compared to paper with improved quality. Um, as I mentioned, this open data kit is part of a, um, an entire ecosystem of open source tools. One of those is something called FormHub, which was developed at Columbia University. Basically what it is, is a free hosted um, service for the ODK toolkit. They also make it very easy to share forms. So once you've um, developed a, a, a data collection instrument, you can post it there and make it available to other researchers. Um, another option for data collection is via web forms. Um, there are some advantages and disadvantages compared to using an app. Um, one of them is that they are totally dependent on having connectivity, so where the apps can function e even when you don't have connectivity. With a web form, you would need connectivity. There's also less um, functionality in terms of capturing GPS coordinates, photos, voice recording, that sort of thing. But it is more easily cross-platform. Um, one of the limitations that you always have to consider is um, apps that work on one device, but um, operating system, but not all. Um, another option is data collection via um, relational database systems. Um, one in particular that I'll cite is FileMaker has something called FileMaker Go. So you can develop a complete um, database applica application and then deploy it to an iPhone or iPad. Um, and they say you can collect research data in the field by recording video and audio and adding the files directly to your database. Another interesting um, option available is data collection via SMS. So just simple text messaging you can send to a server and have it stored in a database. Um, again, SMS has been very popular for information dissemination but um, is also a powerful tool for data collection. Um, one option available is something called Rapid SMS, which was developed by UNICEF. Um, it's developed in a Python Django framework um, and used among other people by the Earth Institute at Columbia University. So apart from the actual um, mechanism used to collect data, what do researchers do in terms of data storage when they're away from campus? Um, how many people here use some form of cloud storage for your data? I imagine most of you do. And um, Dropbox, is that probably the most common? Is there any other um, platforms that people are particularly fond of using? Yeah. yeah. So um, storing data in the cloud, one of the concerns, I don't know if any of uh, the people here were at the session from uh, Western Canada earlier this afternoon, but they referenced there the fact that in Canada there's a certain amount of um, unease about putting data in the cloud that's going to be on American servers, um, partly because of the Patriot Act that there's it's felt to be less um, secure, less um, protected from um, from exposure. So that's one of the concerns that has to be factored in. Um, we need to be able to recommend cloud services to um, researchers in terms of ease of use, downloading, uploading, syncing, um, the ab ability to view multiple formats within the cloud platform, cost and security. Um, another option is storing data back on the campus systems. And that could be done by FTP. There are many FTP tools where you can transfer data from a mobile device back to your 
home environment, or there could be other enterprise solutions that researchers are using. The researcher who um, I've talked about traveling through Latin America, he had access to our SharePoint server back on campus and was um, loading data to SharePoint while, while he was in transit. Um, another option that a lot of researchers take is um, external storage devices. But again, there's a, a vulnerability in relying on those in terms of loss or theft. Um, so some of the tools available, iTransfer, which is available for the iPhone or iPad, where you can either FTP or store data to the cloud. Um, FTP on the go, which um, not only allows you to work from your iPhone, but it allows you to um, access the internet and see what data you've got on your phone um, using any web browser. It features Smart Replace, which will not break your existing files if a phone call is um, or a connection is lost or interrupted. It will still complete the upload and also features compression on the fly. So one of the things that I discovered as I was working with researchers was what I termed specialist devices. I started off thinking just in terms of the common um, smartphones that um, we're accustomed to, but I became quickly aware that there are a lot of specialist devices that are being used by researchers. Um, a company named Allegro uses a lot of, or has developed a lot of technologies for agricultural research. Um, one particular researcher I worked with uses an Allegro device where it stores all of the data on the device itself and it comes with a port so that, so that when you return to your lab or office you just plug the device into the port and it immediately downloads the data as a uh, Excel spreadsheet file and he's been using that system for three or four years. Another company called YSI develops a, a lot of um, water monitoring devices. <coughs> So sensors, instruments, software, as well as a data collection platform for environmental water quality monitoring and testing. Um, one of the researchers that I spoke to uses it for water probes in northern Manitoba. Um, interestingly, he makes redundant paper records even though he's using this device because it doesn't totally divide, um, trust the, the data that's been stored on the device itself. Um, another area that I wanted to talk a little bit about is um, the concept of electronic laboratory notebooks. Can I ask how many people are familiar with the concept of electronic laboratory notebooks? Okay, and do you know of their use on your campuses? Um, one thing that you probably um, wouldn't be familiar with is enterprise um, ELN solutions on your campuses. Um, typically ELNs are, have been pretty common in the commercial sector, pharmaceutical labs and that sort of thing, and they're really growing in um, their use in the academic setting. So one of the reasons I'm drawing attention to this is because with an electronic laboratory notebook system, um, you can use your mobile device and have the same kind of interaction with your data that you do when you're in your lab or office. Um, there was a major um, review last year at the University of Wisconsin-Madison to look at um, the potential for um, electronic laboratory notebooks. Um, they involved 55 researchers from a wide range of disciplines in a three-month pilot study. By the time the study was done, 91% of the researchers wanted to continue using the ELN. Um, some of the rationale for that, paper, rec paper recording is time-consuming. Um, the ELN offers the design of forms and templates that make it very quick and easy, especially when you're talking about um, iterative tests um, that can be um, populated through the ELN. Linking of digital assets. So one of the struggles um, researchers have is that they've got um, quantitative data here. They may have photographs. They may have um, other types of digital assets. Trying to coordinate that can be very challenging, but through the ELN, they can all be linked. As well as linking um, things like test results to um, samples. Um, very often there's a um, sample inventory component of an ELN, so you can have a particular um, 
biological sample that's linked to all the tests that involve that particular sample. It also facilitates um, sharing and collaboration within labs or within research teams. Um, it integrates all of the communication with the research team, makes it far easier to search for and find particular assets. Um, it also facilitates um, data management and archiving to um, comply with institutional and funder policies um, with capabilities for versioning and re restoring um, earlier versions of data files and basically creates a centralized shared knowledge base with um, searchability. <coughs> Excuse me. It allows um, PIs to monitor the work of their research teams, especially when a number of students may be involved. And through the mobile technologies, it's accessible from anywhere. So your entire knowledge base of um, research outputs are available, accessible from anywhere. Um, so through this um, pilot study, the University of Wisconsin-Madison chose a product called RSpace from a research base. And uh, I contacted one of the um, researchers there to get his comments. And this is what uh, he wrote about their move to the ELN. RSpace, or any ELN really, has been one of the best things we've done for our lab. Information on protocols, details on experiments, treatment conditions, results, pictures, westerns, you name it, and it's all available with our space's easy and plain word search feature. This has greatly increased our lab efficiency of research and eliminates duplicating experiments because one of the members didn't know someone else already knew the answer they were after. Now we've used it for almost two years and we'd be lost without it. So that's sort of the landscape that I've been looking at. So what does this mean in terms of a research library? Um, how can we um, take advantage of some of these technologies and strategies that I've been talking about? And I'm basically laying out three options in terms of support strategies for libraries. One is to basically develop a knowledge base so that we can uh, make re recommendations and offer support. Um, an example of this that's um, occurred with me in terms of the research, the uh, interactions I've had with researchers was people just coming to me and saying, okay, I want to buy a device. What kind of device would you recommend? Or I want to use cloud storage. What um, cloud storage solution would you recommend? Things like that. Um, number two is to develop project specific solutions. So some of the tools that we looked at, like the open data kit, the library could um, offer those to researchers and um, sort of support them in, in their deployment for their research projects. And then finally, um, enterprise solutions. So for example, our team, we do offer um, SharePoint as sort of a um, virtual research environment for document sharing and collaboration. Um, there, there are things like an ELN that could be in an enterprise solution, but those are some of the um, strategies that could be considered. So that's um, it, and thank you very much for uh, helping me come here.